Good morning, guys. This is Mike C. Coming at you, as always, from beautiful, sunny Halifax, Nova Scotia. Plants and Society webcast series. So today we're going to be talking about cotton. Very common plant. Arguably one of our most important non-food plants globally. So, start off like usual. Who knows where cotton comes from? Don't all raise your hands at once now. Cotton is actually a global plant. Uh, the Gossypium genus, it's got about 30 species under it, is found in every continent except Antarctica, usually preferring the warmer, uh, wetter, more tropical areas. Uh, it's found in a variety of colors, and it's interestingly been discovered independently by human civilizations all across the world over history. So the earliest traces of this plant are in Peru, the Peruvian Andes on the coast. Uh, in the American Southwest as well, about 10,000 years ago, we see human usage of the Gossypium plant. However, the most widespread use is found in the Indus Valley about 5,000 years ago in the Mahendradaro civilization. So we're going way back now. So it's here I'd like to talk about what the plant, what the plant is. What is this cotton that we're talking about? So this is a annual plant that develops a fruit, a pod. And within this pod, uh, seeds sprout out and employ fibers to fly off, take carried by the wind, and it propagates itself in that way. So one seed can hold about 20,000 of these hairs of varying lengths. Uh, and basically they go and they blow off, scoot around the countryside, and this is how the plant spreads itself. Not a bad strategy, I suppose, right? So, Mahendradaro is here. This is a very, this is an interesting place located in modern day Pakistan. And this is a, uh, an ancient civilization. It's here we see the most widespread use and the most highly developed looms and combs and processing materials of the day. Interestingly, uh, a lot of the, pr pretty much all over the world where cotton was used and employed, we see very similar processing materials, the same combs, looms. So either this is a testament to human ingenuity and in that we've all come up with the same same techniques to use this stuff, or that this this is a plant that goes deep into human history early in our migratory periods. So yeah, Mahendra Darrow, go here. So over time the use of this plant uh, the knowledge of its cultivation spread from this Indus Valley area westward with Alexander the Great and the Hellenic world. And basically it was Alexander and his, his boys who brought the, uh, brought the plant to the Mediterranean. And it's, it was in the Greco-Roman times where this plant really took hold in this, in this region. So there's a preference for linens at the time. Cotton took a back seat during the Greco-Roman epoch. Uh, it was frequently mentioned in texts, though, and it's generally accepted that it was about uh, the late Hellenic period where cotton, widespread cotton usage really arrives in the Middle East. So Muslims began to cultivate this, uh, this plant in a more sophisticated and basically widespread manner, using it as a more important textile than linens during the 9th and 10th century. And it's actually the word cotton, meaning cotton in Arabic, where we get our modern day word cotton. So yet another uh, agricultural um, reason to thank uh, the Islamic civilization for giving us something else of great importance. The Moors, who would have guessed it? brought cotton from North Africa, Islamic North Africa, into Spain. And it was here that cotton really made its first inroads into European society. The sophisticated and cultured Mediterranean Moors and Arabs bringing this plant over really integrated it, or began to integrate it into European society. Now after the Moorish dominance of, of Iberia, uh, Spanish explorers arrived in the Americas, and what did they find? They found natives wearing richly decorated cotton clothes, which was still a very high-end commodity in Europe. 
And this pr probably stiffened Columbus's resolve that he'd arrived in India. He actually went to his deathbed thinking that. Because we have Cotton to blame partially for this. Cotton was still a very uncommon material in Europe until about the 1600s. Ah. The old world varieties had shorter hairs than the new world varieties. And during the 1600s, the British and Dutch East India companies began to circumvent overland Arab trade routes uh, from India back over and started bringing more richly rich and fine cottons uh, directly to Northern Europe, feeding the burgeoning middle class, who were still using wool as their main, as their dominant fabric. Cotton became known as calico after Calicut, India, where this became the most more popular form of cotton in, the, uh, in Europe at the time. The stuff was soon being raised in Virginia in the Americas, uh, feeding this nascent European market. Now, the world's most dominant form, uh, Gossipium hirsutum, actually rose in Central America here, in the Tihuacan Valley of Mexico. Uh, and eventually spread south to Peru uh, and north to the American Southwest, where Zuni and Navajo people used it. Traces from the Tihuacan Valley, however, go back to 3500 BC. So you can see that cotton really had an important, played an important role in um, Central American Mesoamerican life. And it was these strains that are actually going to be the ones that move up into North America. These longer-haired strains and uh, feed, the, feed the Virginia plantations that are supplying Europe with its high-quality, long-fibered cotton. Now, the nature of cotton harvesting for the uh, Mexicans as well as the North Americans has always been very labor-intensive. Bulls had to be either directly harvested uh, in the fields or plucked out manually. They were mechanically separated for extraction, a process called ginning at the time. Uh, however, the first mechanical gin was invented in India, but it only worked with the one Indian species. It didn't work with these long-haired Native American species of cotton. So, my American history buffs out there will recognize this, this face. Uh, good old Eli Whitney in the year 1793. He invented the first seed separator, the first real industrial-scale cotton gin that would work with all, with all forms of cotton. And before this invention, it was taking a day to yield about 50 pounds of cotton. I'm sorry, to extract one pound of cotton, whereas the cotton gin could yield 50 pounds per day. So this development led to a huge increase in demand in the European market and stimulated a, a boom in cotton production on uh, the plantations in the United States. Uh, so there's only a short hop from here to the to the homeland of Gossipium hirsutum, this long-haired, long-haired variety. So prior to this invention, the only financially feasible cotton operations in the South were located on the coast, uh, areas where you could grow the staple forms, long forms of cotton. The drier interior regions, however, were limited. Uh, suitable, the area was suitable only for the short short strains. Suddenly, with the cotton gin, it became possible to glean a marketable harvest out of these shorter varieties. And the, uh, the cotton belt, you could say the waistline of the cotton belt, spread far westward into the deep south. And before too long, cotton was replacing even tobacco as the cash crop of the American south. Soon, the United States was producing the vast majority of the world's cotton. What did this give rise to? Well, you're looking at it. Basically, the slave culture and the slave economy of the southern United States, which was being phased out at the time, saw a rapid spike. Um, with the drop in price of cotton, uh, the huge demand in Europe, slavery uh, really saw a resurgence. So this is one invention, the cotton gin, had major impacts. In 1790, the numbers vary here, but in 1790, uh, there were about 700,000 slaves in the south producing about one and a half million pounds of cotton. By 1860, the eve of the Civil War, four million slaves were producing two billion pounds of cotton. West African descended uh, slaves made up about half of the population of the southern United States at the time, 
especially in the cotton belts on the eve of the Civil War. And the resulting economy is what we know as the antebellum South. This was a, basically a two-tiered system. You had slaves and lower-class white folks, uh, and a thin veneer of rich, wealthy aristocrats. You know, this famous society that's portrayed in works like Gone with the Wind and Mark Twain. The antebellum South, you know, still somehow nostalgically remembered by many white Southerners, right? I suppose if you were on the right side of the equation. It was an epic in world history, however, that was based very much on one strain of one unique plant. And so this cotton society is real. It's a real epic in United States history and global history. So you can see that uh, without venturing too much into his per personal life, you can look it up if you want, it's pretty explicit. South Carolina and Henry Hammond famously said, and I quote, what would happen if no cotton was furnished for three years? I will not stop to depict what everyone can imagine, but this is certain. England would soon topple headlong and carry the whole civilized world with her, save the South, of course. Now you dare not make war on cotton. No power on earth dares to make war upon it. Cotton is king. Precious few plants in our history have actually been dubbed king. And even after the war, the southern United States remained hugely economically dependent upon this one crop. As we all know, undiversified investments can be uh, particularly risky. And diversity doesn't seem to be something that the uh, southern United States does very well anyway. Right? So during this time, India, which had always been a global leader in cotton production, suddenly saw itself overshadowed by the hugely mechanized economy of the United States. They were being outpaced, basically. So by the 19-teens, India had actually become a net importer of finished cotton products for the first time in its long global economic history. So there was a lot of accusations of dumping from your non-economy economics geeks out there. This is the selling of products at below the cost of local manufacturing, so just basically shutting everyone out of business, all the local cotton producers. Luckily, India had this guy, Mahatma Gandhi, on the scene, who uh, encouraged the Indians to boycott British goods by spending their own cotton products at home. And these textiles, historically in Indian culture, have been known as khadi, uh, and became a symbol of, of Indian nationalism and anti-colonialism at the time. And interestingly, even the, uh, the Indian flag you know, legally, on paper, can only be made out of this Kadi material. So it's very interesting. I'd recommend you something to Google one of these days if you've got nothing else to do. But Kadi is, in Indian society, is a very interesting place. So, today, what's happening? Cotton is the most common natural fiber in the world. And it's arguably, like we said before, our most important non-food plant. Large bioengineering firms, like everyone's favorite, Monsanto, uh, as well as others, have actually transformed this modern, this ancient plant into a modern, modern derivatives. Uh, you get products such as Bolgard, which actually, it's a strain of cotton, which actually produces a gene which yields a toxin, a toxic insecticide, uh, to defend against pests. So this has had great success yielding, increasing yields in India. However, you know, one of, you know, Monsanto's story in India isn't the most pleasant one. However, India does remain a, a huge global player in the world cotton market, and likely will for the foreseeable future. So, there we have it. Cotton, the most important plants in our lives, I'd say. Try going a couple days without it. You'll see what I mean. So, yeah, this is Mike C., Plants and Society.